Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part two of the 52 story treehouse by Andy Griffiths and Terry Denton continuing from chapter four fun with vegetables by vegetable patty dedicated to my darling parents squashed but not forgotten hi vegetable patty here as we all know vegetable fighting is a serious business but that doesn't mean it can't be fun don't believe me well read my book Boil them, broil them, salt and oil them, crunch them, munch them, knock out, punch them, grab them, stab them, shish kebab them, throw them, mow them, taekwondo them, kick them, flick them, pogo stick them, mash them, smash them, Whip and lash them. Whack them. Smack them. Snap, lock, sack them. Crush them. Mush them. Drown and flush them. That's enough, Andy, says Terry, his hands over his eyes. I can't take any more. It's too violent. I never thought I'd say this, but I actually feel sorry for those poor vegetables. Me too, I say. It's kind of weird to feel sorry for something you hate so much. I know, says Terry, but whoever wrote this book must hate vegetables even more than we do. You can say that again, I say. Whoever wrote this book must hate vegetables even more than we do, he says. Terry, I say, I didn't mean for you to actually say it again, but I'm kind of glad you did. Why? Because it's true. Whoever wrote this book must hate vegetables even more than we do. Chapter 5. Sleeping Jill. So, do you think the book is a clue, says Terry? Does it have something to do with Mr. Big Nose's disappearance? Maybe, I say. It was published by Mr. Big Nose, but it still doesn't explain where he is. We need to keep looking. Terry holds up a magnifying glass and continues investigating. Look at this pen, he says. It's huge. And look at this trophy. It's gigantic. And look at this paperclip. It's massive. Um, Terry, I say. Terry turns to me, still looking through the magnifying glass. Yikes, he says. You're enormous too. No, I'm not, I say. And neither is that paperclip. You're just looking at everything through your biggest magnifying glass. Ah, says Terry. Another mystery solved. Yes, I say. But not the right one. We're supposed to be figuring out the mystery of the missing Mr. Big Nose, not the mystery of why everything looks enormous to you. Oh, yeah, says Terry. Uh, good point. Terry peers at a large letter sleeve on Mr. Big Nose's desk. Look at this caterpillar, he says. I think it might be a clue. It's trembling, like it's frightened. Whatever happened to Mr. Big Nose, this poor little guy must have seen the whole thing. If only caterpillars could talk, I say. They can, says Terry. It's just that we can't understand them. If only we knew somebody who could understand caterpillars, I say. Somebody like Jill, says Terry. Somebody exactly like Jill, I say. Hey, I know, says Terry. Why don't we get Jill to talk to the caterpillar? No. I've got a better idea, I say. Why don't we get the caterpillar to talk to Jill? But that's the same as my idea, says Terry. Sort of, I say. But mine's better. We've got to get this caterpillar to Jill so it can tell her what happened to Mr. Big Nose so that we can find him and remind him to remind us about our deadline so that we can finish this book. That sounds complicated, says Terry. Not at all, I say. It's elementary, my dear Denton. To the flying fried egg car. Up, up. And away! The day we flew our flying fried egg car to Jill's house and nobody knew it was us because they all thought it was just a flying fried egg. Look at that flying fried egg car. No, not a car, just a big flying fried egg. Whoa, hey, a flying fried egg. That's even weirder than a flying cat. Flying fried egg car? No, fried egg not fly. Car not fly either. Me confused. Is that some kind of flying machine? Nope, just a big flying fried egg. That's good, Carl. Frog flying a helicopter drone. We land outside Jill's house, or at least where we think her house is. It's hard to tell because her garden is very overgrown. Wow, says Terry. Jill has really let this place go. Yes, I say. I can't even see how we're going to get in. I can't even see how she would be able to get out, says Terry. Maybe she can't, I say. I mean, have you seen her lately? No, says Terry. Have you? Not for a while. Now that I think about it, all the times we haven't seen Jill lately. Pet fashion parade. I'm surprised Jill's not here. Excellent fish suit. I'm surprised Jill's not here. Shh, 
Barky, the Barking Dog, the movie. People captured by Captain Woodenhead, reunion. I'm surprised Jill's not here. Happy birthday, Jill. I'm surprised Jill's not here. Looks like we have another mystery to solve, I say. The mystery of why we haven't seen Jill lately. Yay, says Terry. And I've just, well, I've got just what we need to solve it. He reaches into a bag and pulls out two safari suits and two razor-sharp machetes. He hands me one of each. Thanks, Terry, I say. Don't thank me, he says. Thank the disguise, I'm Attic 5000. I grabbed a bag of takeaway before we left. We put on our safari suits and use our machetes to start hacking into the plants surrounding Jill's house. We hack, hack, and chop, chop, and cut, cut, and thwack, thwack, and hack, hack. Until finally we find ourselves at the front door. We ring the doorbell, but nobody answers. So we chop, and cut, and thwack, and hack. Until at last we smash through the door into Jill's house, and this is what we see. They're asleep, I say. I'm surprised the noise we made chopping and cutting through the door didn't wake them up. Yeah, says Terry, not to mention the thwacking and hacking. We go into the kitchen and find Jill. She's fast asleep too. Wake up, Jill, I say, shaking her shoulder. Wake up. But she doesn't wake up. She's not waking up, says Terry. I can see that, I say. Shh, Andy, says Terry. You'll wake her up. That's exactly what I want to do, I yell. But even my yelling doesn't wake her up. We try everything we can think of. Megaphones, gongs, air horns, electric guitars, jackhammers, dynamite, boom. But nothing works, not even poking. Hmm, I say, this is no ordinary sleep. This is what's known in the storytelling trade as enchanted sleep, like in Sleeping Beauty. Oh, I love that story, says Terry, but it's scary when the barn catches fire and the horses are all frightened. That's Black Beauty, I say. Sleeping Beauty is a fairy tale about a princess with a curse on her who pricks her finger on a very sharp spindle and falls asleep for a hundred years. But there's nothing that looks like a very sharp spindle here, says Terry, examining the table with a magnifying glass. Well, nothing except this very sharp carrot. Good detecting, Terry, I say. Jill must have had a curse on her and she pricked her finger on that carrot. But why would Jill have a curse on her, says Terry? I don't know, I say. Looks like we have another mystery to solve. Yay, says Terry. But poor Jill, will she have to sleep for a hundred years? Not necessarily, I say. In the fairy tale, Sleeping Beauty is woken by a kiss. Yuck, says Terry. I'm not kissing her. It's okay, I say. I'll do it. I lean down, close my eyes as tight as I can, and put my lips on her cheek. It's not working, says Terry. She's not waking up. It might be because I'm not a handsome prince, I say. It's usually a handsome prince who does the kissing in fairy tales. Prince Charming, Prince Lovely, Prince Dreamy. Not so handsome princes. Frog Prince, Prince Not So Charming and Prince Potato. Well, I guess we need a handsome prince then, says Terry. But where will we find one of those? What about the castle, I say? What castle, says Terry? That castle, I say, pointing to a castle on a distant hill just visible through Jill's overgrown window. Oh, that castle, says Terry. Funny, but I've never noticed it before. Me neither, I say, but it sure looks like the sort of castle where you'd find a handsome prince. Grab Jill, put her in a glass coffin, get the caterpillar, and let's go. Um, Andy, says Terry, there's one small problem. What's that, I say? Uh, the caterpillar has eaten our flying fried egg car. Chapter 6. Journey to the Castle. Well, that's just great, I say, looking at the remains of our flying fried egg car. How are we supposed to get to the castle now? Don't worry, says Terry. I've got just the thing. He reaches into his bag and pulls out a horse costume. How is that going to help us get to the castle? I say. Simple, says Terry. You put it on and I'll ride you there. Terry hands me the costume. Naha, I say, handing it back. How about you put it on and I ride you there? I've got a better idea, says Terry, passing the costume back to me. How about we take turns? Great idea, I say, and since you thought of it, you can go first. Thanks, Andy, says Terry, taking the costume. You're a real pal. He puts it on, and we set off. What a lovely day for horse riding, I say. Is it your turn to be the horse yet, says Terry? No, not yet, I say. How's the caterpillar, says Terry? Good, I say, I think it's really enjoying the ride. I sure hope we don't come across anything that would be hazardous to caterpillars on our journey, says Terry. 
Me too, I say, as an enormous black bird swoops down towards us. A bird's hazardous to caterpillars, says Terry. Yes, I say. I reach out to put my hand over the caterpillar, but before I can cover it, the caterpillar rears up, opens its mouth, and swallows the bird in one gulp. Snap! What happened, says Terry? Is the caterpillar okay? It's fine, I say, but that bird's not doing so well. The caterpillar just ate it. I never thought a caterpillar could eat a bird, says Terry. Neither did I, I say. It must be a bird-eating caterpillar. We continue along the road and come to a sharp bend. We hear a loud rumbling noise. What do you think that is, says Terry? I may be wrong, and I hope I am, I say, but it sounds like two steamrollers having a race. You're right, says Terry, as two steamrollers come speeding around the bend towards us. Start galloping, I say to Terry, as fast as you can. Terry looks around frantically. I can't gallop, he says. I'm not a real horse, you know. Then we're doomed, I say. If the first steamroller doesn't squash us flat, the second one will for sure. At that moment, the caterpillar jumps off Terry's head, leaps down onto the road and starts inching its way towards the steamrollers. No, says Terry, putting his hooves over his eyes. I can't bear to look either. I turn away and prepare myself for the sound of a caterpillar being squashed by two speeding steamrollers. But instead, I hear the sound of a caterpillar burping. I look up. The steamrollers are nowhere to be seen, and the caterpillar is licking its tiny little lips. I don't believe it, I say. It ate two speeding steamrollers. That caterpillar saved our lives, says Terry. That's weird, I say. I can smell rhinoceroses. Yeah, me too, says Terry. And I can see them, three big ones, charging right at us. But before we even have time to panic, the caterpillar rears up, opens its mouth wide, and gulp, gulp, gulp. Wow, I've never seen a caterpillar eat three charging rhinoceroses before, says Terry. What about four wacky, waving, inflatable, arm-flailing tube men, I say. Nope, haven't seen that either, says Terry. Why do you ask? Because there are four of them blocking the road ahead. Cool, says Terry. I love those guys. So does the caterpillar, I say. Look at it go. Gulp, 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 gulp. Those poor, wacky, waving, inflatable, arm-flailing tube men, says Terry. They didn't deserve to die like that. What about those five giant mutant spiders, I say. They definitely deserve to die like that, says Terry. Go, little caterpillar, go. Gulp, 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 gulp. It's lucky we brought this caterpillar with us, says Terry. This is the most dangerous road ever. There ought to be a warning sign. There is, I say. Look. Warning. Enormous birds. Speeding steamrollers. Charging rhinoceroses. Wacky, waving, inflatable, arm-flailing tube men. And giant mutant spiders use this road, so watch out. We walk on. I'm tired, says Terry. Is it your turn to be the horse yet? Not yet, I say. Besides, we're almost there. Look. On the hill ahead of us is the castle. It's surrounded by a wall of asparagus spears. Gee, they've really gone with the vegetable theme, haven't they, said Terry. That's because it's a vegetable castle, says a wrinkled old tomato sitting by the side of the road. Vegetables only pass this point. A vegetable castle, I say. Yes, it sprouted a few days ago, says the tomato. It's part of Prince Potato's vegetable kingdom. Great, I say. We need a prince to wake our friend here from her enchanted sleep. Giddy up, Terry. Not so fast, says the tomato, blocking our way. You can't go up there. You shouldn't even be here. The castle and its surroundings are for vegetables only. Then, what are you doing here, I say? You're not a vegetable. You're a fruit. I am so a vegetable, says the tomato. When was the last time you ate a tomato for dessert? You have fruit for dessert. Tomatoes are strictly main course. But you have seeds, and you grow from the flowering part of a plant, says Terry, which technically makes you a fruit. You want to get technical, says the tomato, growing quite red in the face. Well, let me tell you, buddy, that no less than an authority than the United States Supreme Court has ruled that a tomato is a vegetable for the purposes of customs regulation. So there. OK, OK, I say, trying to calm it down. If you say you're a vegetable, then you're a vegetable, even if you do have seeds. Don't talk to me about seeds, spits the tomato. Cucumbers have seeds and you never hear anybody calling them a fruit. And peppers have hundreds of seeds, but nobody would mistake one of them for a fruit. And what about squash? Seeds. Seeds all the way through. And don't even get me started on rutabagas. What is a rutabaga? Whispers Terry. I don't know, I say, but I get the feeling we're about to find out. Terry sighs. We're never going to get to that castle. Shh, I say. Listen, I can't hear anything. That's my point, I say. The tomato has stopped talking. 
There's a reason for that, says Terry. The caterpillar just ate it. That's the first healthy choice it's made all day, I say. And that is where we will leave part two of the 52-story treehouse by Andy Griffiths and Terry Denton. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.